I'm still Fran Marie Kennedy, uh, and I'm still from the Aspen Institute. Uh, and I'm moderating this panel. This is the first of our panels. It's the Barriers to Innovation and Promoting Innovation. Uh, and it's based on the booklet that you've gotten in your, in your packet. Uh, and these are two of our wonderful authors. And we've already heard that we are in the best of times and the worst of times from Sam about uh, leading the world in, in uh, innovative uh, research and science and, and medicine and yet lagging behind in the delivery system. And we did come up with a number of uh, recommendations in the, um, the white paper, and I'd like to just focus on three of them tonight, today and ask both of you to sort of react and give me an opinion uh, on improving the patient experience, of which also Sam had discussed, organizing the way providers uh, practice, and obviously saving money, which Sam also <laughs> underscored, so that we can ensure long-term financial stability and uh, sustainability and uh, continued research on the important breakthroughs that need to happen in, a, in, in medicine. So I'm gonna start with you, Carol. Sure. And Carol, I'm supposed to be, I don't moderate very much. I'm supposed to have uh, introduced you. Uh, Carol um, Grayson is the, um, Jacobs Professor at the Department of Health Systems Administration at Georgetown University, and she left Rand after many years to mm -hmm. join their group, and we're excited that you did, because we love Georgetown. Uh, and Sean Martin is the Vice President for Practice Trans Transformation and Advocacy at the American Academy for Family Physicians, and their uh, larger bios are also in your handouts. So over to you, Carol. Thanks. So I'll start with the second recommendation that Fran Marie mentioned about the organization and delivery of care. And I think historically we haven't seen much innovation around the organization and delivery of care because of the incentives in the healthcare system that, that weren't there to promote it, either in terms of research dollars to support research around delivery system innovation or in terms of the reimbursement structure, at least for public payers, and not incenting providers to think about ways in which they could provide the same or higher quality of care at lower cost. And so I think, as Dr. Nussbaum said, the Affordable Care Act really pushes us in that direction with both the advent of CMMI and also with the accountable care organizations. And I think what's exciting when we look at accountable care organizations is that um, the payment model is the same. So providers in an ACO get a capitated payment. But what's exciting to see is the incredible diversity in the approaches that ACOs are taking to reduce, um, pay, reduce costs while keeping quality the same or improving quality. At an ACO conference I was at um, just a few days ago, some of the ACOs were really focused on end-of-life care and others were focused on improving the accessibility of the healthcare system for underutilizers who would then at some point later on have high healthcare costs. And I think what's important is that we are exploring these different models within ACOs and that there might not be a one size fits all solution and it could be population specific. So the ACO that works in Pennsylvania might be different than the ACO that works in California or other populations. So I think that these experimentation that we're seeing with both ACOs and other kinds of healthcare delivery are a really important part of pushing us forward. And the challenge really is the science that goes along with that. Can we get payments right? Mm -hmm. Do we have the right quality metrics? Because the devil's in the details, and those mm -hmm. things really matter uh, in terms of the success of these new uh, payment delivery models. Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's good to be in San Francisco. And I'm, I'm actually going to take on the uh, patient engagement or, or consumer experience with the healthcare system. And, and I think to give just a little perspective, you know, our healthcare system largely uh, reflects the rest of, of our economy. It was largely uh, built upon ideologies that came out of World War II. It was a manufacturing economy. Um, <clears throat> we built large institutions and we built very rigid rules around our healthcare system, all of which were designed and built uh, for the healthcare professionals, uh, not necessarily for the patients that they were providing care for. And that's not a, a negative statement towards the healthcare system, that was just the way it was. Uh, doctor's offices were open from 8 to 4.30. Um, if you had to take your child, you, one, took your child out of school, two, you miss work, uh, and three, you probably had to do something else that day, whether it was lab or pharmacy or et cetera. So the, so the healthcare system, um, you know, is not patient-centric, which is a, a very popular word. 
Um, but it wasn't always that way. You know, there were days of house calls and um, the healthcare system was largely more focused on providing uh, care to patients uh, at their time and at their need. Um, <clears throat> much of this, you know, I, I think is beginning to come uh, full circle and, and, and appropriately. Uh, but the healthcare system at all levels uh, is going to have to redesign itself uh, to become um, patient friendly, not, I, I don't want to say patient friendly, to become patient accessible uh, and designed to meet patients where they want to meet the healthcare system, not uh, have patients meet the healthcare system where it's convenient for providers, regardless of who that provider is. Uh, you see concepts as a medical home, there's you know telemedicine, um, retail health clinics. I mean, anything you look uh, is really designed to meet patients where they want to uh, receive their health care. And this all came into focus for me a, a, about eight months ago because I um, was in a very interesting conversation about retail health clinics and, uh, you know, uh, making some arguments around how uh, that kind of violated, you know, my core principles of continuous and comprehensive primary care. And uh, the gentleman I was speaking to started laughing, which is always um, a, a welcome and you know he said look all, all of this innovation in primary care and care delivery is is because of your failure and you know I kind of jerked my head back and he said you know pri you know the healthcare system uh, is not available to patients when they want to seek and receive health care he says if they want to go get health care at Walmart at four in the morning uh, that is when they want to go to get their health care and, and you're going to have to design ways to make the health care system more available to these patients so uh, I think the paper outlines uh, a number of factors, but I, I just think that philosophical, you know, moving from the uh, manufacturing economy and, and, you know, matching the rest of our institutions, uh, whether it be banking or anything else, it's, it's real time and, and it's on the consumer um, level. Thanks. <laughs> Let's uh, move on to the okay. cost of innovation uh, in the <laughs> America's hospitals. Um, in 2010, uh, the median operating margin in the U.S. Uh, hospitals was 2.75 percent. And another statistic had 30 percent of all hospitals in negative operating uh, margins. Now, with that kind of um, low margin, how are we going to add uh, some 16 to 30 million new uh, health care on the roll? And um, can we afford such a dramatic expansion? <laughs> um, well, Carol knows I'll get myself in trouble on this. Um, I, I don't. I, I think when we look at the acute-based delivery models, uh, historically, uh, they can't survive in the future, and and I would argue that they shouldn't survive in their current form in the future. Um, I think you have to decentralize healthcare. Healthcare is is rapidly becoming more ambulatory just by default. Uh, things that. We used to rely upon acute-based settings to provide. I mean, now it can be provided in an ambulatory setting. Uh, there's a, there's a lag in payment models, but um, I th I think there was an attempt in the 80s to consolidate hospitals, and that did not go very well. Uh, but I think the next attempt to consolidate hospitals is is one going to be driven by integration. So hospitals are going to integrate with other hospitals, and you, you'll start to see. Uh, very similar to the banking industry, I think, where you'll have very large uh, academic-based acute care institutions radiating outward through suburban community and rural hospitals. But I, I just don't, uh, I just don't see the hospital industry existing in a decade like it exists today. Carol? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that uh, as the system is transforming, the institutions within the system are, have to transform at the same time. And um, part of the push for ACOs is integrating the hospital and the providers mm -hmm. more, and perhaps um, those uh, payment mechanisms will, you know, shift the cost structure in hospitals in, in ways that we haven't imagined. So uh, I agree with Sean. I think there's just some fundamental transformation among these institutions. Okay, let's turn our attention to the patients. Um, interestingly enough, everyone knows patients tend to drive innovation in therapies and, and new drugs, uh, and yet in the delivery system, uh, they're not even engaged in the, in the innovation uh, conversation. Uh, my question is, uh, is there a way of engaging patients in that? So, so I'll, I'll take that one first. So I think 
Um, when we think about consumer engagement, there's at least three factors that have limited consumer engagement in the past. One is financial, and so um, are consumers cost conscious consumers in the market? And um, there's been a push to, uh, through consumer defined health plans, to put more skin in the game for consumers. That's a very blunt instrument. Or um, sort of value based insurance design, which Dr. Nussbaum talked a little bit about, uh, where consumers have to pay a little bit more depending on the value of the healthcare service. And there's a lot of um, research that has to go into determining you know, what are high value services and how do you design those insurance plans that put people more at risk for services that are, that are less valuable. Um, so financial issues are something that I think, uh, or financial stake is something that's limited consumer engagement. And then a second factor is cultural. So do we have a culture in which physicians and patients are communicating in a way about the treatment options uh, and even the cost of those, of those different treatment options? And so that's a second barrier. And then third is informational. You know, having the kinds of price and quality information uh, that, uh, that they need to make good, good uh, decisions. And in addition, also feeling like with their health information that they have provider choice. And so often I think consumers feel locked into a provider because all of their records are with that provider. And the promise of health IT, or at least one of it, is can consumers feel more like they have um, more choice and you don't have that provider lock because they own their records. And I think we've seen you know, pushes along all three of those dimensions. So we've seen more consumers who are put at more financial stake for some of their health care. We have to be careful in this area because we know, for example, from some recent studies that consumers and consumer-defined health plans sometimes limit both um, wasteful care but also things like preventive care that they should be getting. And so ensuring that consumers know how to operate and uh, 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 with those kinds of health plans. And then we've also seen some, um, some progress um, on price and quality, making sure that those things are, are more transparent. I don't think we've hit the end of the road yet. There's a lot to be done, and quality metrics are, I would say, in their infancy. Um, and still, finding out costs of care can be a real challenge, in particular because there's different bundling of services that goes into defining a price. So there's movement in all those things, and I think probably where we, um, where we need research is really understanding how can we change the culture of patient and physician relationships. I think that's, a, that's an important area as well. Yeah, I, I, I would just echo almost all of that. I, I think one of the, you know, the challenges that particularly primary care, but all, all physicians face is, is this idea that um, the physician and the patient are in a joint venture. Um, you know, they are partners in this uh, longitudinal process of health. And that, that's foreign um, to, you know, to a lot of physicians. And, and I mean, let's be honest, the, the information that have, is available to each of us on our, you know, smartphones is um, hundreds of thousands of times more than, you know, our parents had. When they, I mean, when they went, when our parents went to the physician, the the only information that they probably had was what the physician told them. I mean, that was all the knowledge they had of the healthcare system was what was recited to them by a physician. Today, we walk into the physician's office. We've probably uh, amateurishly diagnosed ourselves. We probably know uh, how much my copay is going to be with with WellPoint. We probably know what uh, pharmaceutical interventions we want to take. We probably know what lab tests need to be ordered, not always accurately, but we, you know, we're, we're it's a consumerism world and, and consumers are better prepared. Some consumers, not all consumers. Uh, I think the other thing on, on patient engagement, and, and I always like to make this point, and it, I, I promise they don't give me kickbacks, but oftentimes we, you know, we have to think about care, caregivers as well as patients, because there's a number of, of people, whether it's the hot spotting example that uh, Dr. Nussbaum gave or uh, elderly patients or children, you know, a lot of these decisions and the interaction with the healthcare system are, you know, take place between a caregiver and, a, and their healthcare team or physicians, not necessarily the patient themselves. So uh, that comes with all kinds of uh, additional obstacles that have to be overcome. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think that with the availability of all this information to consumers, a key challenge is trying to make sure that consumers have the tools or the ability to process that information. And I think that um, one of the things that research needs to work on is understanding when 
patients are faced with different treatment choices or a different drug choice which has different risks, mm -hmm. what are the best ways to communicate those risks to patients in a way that they understand? And that can vary depending on the patient population you're, you're talking to, their education level, their, uh, their language, or how sick they are. But mm -hmm. understanding how to give consumers information that they can use to make their decisions well, I think that's a, an area that, that needs further exploration. Yeah. And this is a great, I, I just came up with something. So, I, and I'm not even getting into social determinants of health and disparities and, and language barriers and culture barriers and all of those things. I mean, there's a lot of work taking place and more work needs to be done. But um, I'm just, and I think Caroline, both, I, I'm just talking about structural issues with, you know, how you deal with information. So I, I think the other challenges of, you know, culturally appropriate uh, language barriers, I think all of those, um, you know, often are community-driven uh, mm -hmm. remedies uh, because communities respond. But uh, you know, I mean, we can't we can't ignore the you know the role that some of the social determinants have on just how people interact with the healthcare, from poverty to uh, homelessness, et cetera. I mean, there's there's just a lot of factors that um, make it impossible to even begin this engagement, and we we, we have to be mindful of that. I'm going to stay with that theme okay. in a, in right now um, by asking the President's stimulus bill that was uh, passed early in, in his uh, tenure um, had billions for HIT, health mm -hmm. IT. Is that going to remove the barriers to consumers in, in health innovation? <laughs> um, I'm going to be Pollyannish and say yes, although I don't really believe it. Um, uh, I, I think the it's going to ultimately improve the flow of information. Um, I think it's going to empower um, healthcare teams, whether it's physicians or hospitals or integrated systems, to uh, analyze uh, information better, uh, quicker. Um, I think it's you know, but how that trickles down to to consumers, I'm just I, I'm just not convinced beyond. Uh, real-time communication and some of the you know expectations of just kind of con consumerism as I call it in our economy that you know I, I don't know I mean you get your labs uh, emailed out to you and it comes with a little brief explanation but you know I, I don't know that it really gets beyond data sharing and information sharing but I think on the function side of the healthcare system it's going to have a, a, a very significant impact and I, I think you uh, when you hear big healthcare systems talk about their ability to manage populations, mm -hmm. um, you know that's where the data is is going to come. Um, I have lots of scars from basically telling you know our physicians that this is no longer a choice; they're going to have to do this, and uh, they don't really like it. Um, but they're there. I mean, I, you know, I can report today that 73% of all family physicians in this country have an electronic health record in their in their office. Um, you know, about 65% of them are using it um, at or near the definitions of meaningful use. So it's it's not that you know the primary care infrastructure, at least from family physicians, aren't adopting it. Um, it's more like you know taking your child for a flu shot. I mean, they're just screaming every step of the way. And, um, but they're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Carol? Yeah, so I would add that, um, so one thing I think that health IT can do is, um, as I mentioned already, is that if people feel like they own their medical records and they feel like they can have um, you know, greater provider choice, that's important, or maybe that also translates into a feeling of owning their own health care mm -hmm. and health care problems. So I think that's important. But the, you know, the other important thing on the, on the provider side is, um, as Sean mentioned, the population health perspective. And so one of the things that I did was work with some clinics in Montgomery County, Maryland um, that serve an uninsured population. And they implemented a very basic health information system that collected sociodemographic information and collected information on chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. And when we analyzed that data for them, it was really eye-opening for them to look at the health needs of the populations and realize, and realize that they had a lot more depression and mental health issues going on, which then caused them to back up and think about the ways in which they could improve the uh, uh, capacity or availability of mental health specialists. But they also realized things like, 
uh, what percentage of their patient population at certain clinics uh, were speakers of certain languages, which then caused them to think about ways in which they could increase the availability of, of those languages. So I think that the same promise for physicians when they have health IT and they can look at the population health, they can better think about uh, prevention and the kinds of care that their patients might need. And then finally, I would say too that um, oftentimes I, I keep a food log, right, to see what I've eaten. And at the end of the day, I think about what I thought I ate versus what I did eat, and it's often very different. And, and I think for physicians, really looking at um, their practice patterns so that they can say, wow, okay, I had X people with X condition, and here's the different ways in which I treated them. So helping uh, providers be more aware of their own practice patterns and how their own practice patterns are vis-a-vis -vis other providers. Mm -hmm. So even if, even if health IT is siloed, which right now it pretty much is, there's still a lot of promise for health IT for those kinds of things. And then if we can move beyond the siloed health IT towards data sharing between ambulatory care providers and hospitals, then you realize the other kinds of efficiencies like less redundant care and um, that sort of thing. I feel like that's much farther away. And so it's a slow process where health IT has to be accepted, it has to be adopted, but I think that we can realize some of these benefits along that trajectory until we have that full implementation, data sharing, all of that kind of uh, uh, thing at the end. And I'm going to have one last question. I'm going to open it up to the floor so you can start thinking now. Uh, the last question is, are there limits to health IT that we should be recognizing? <laughs> um, no, I, 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 don't, I don't think they're, they're, well, if we put aside privacy, which you can have a whole symposium on healthcare privacy and all of that world. But uh, in, the, in the process side, no, I, I think it's unlimited. I mean, I, I think the ability of information to drive anything, but you know, in this case, healthcare is, is only a good thing. I, I think one of the you know, humorous things that's taking place, and um, I've listened to all these experts talk about e-prescribing and um, you know, how wonderful it's working and kind of how the system uh, has really kind of taken hold and e-prescribing is becoming more standard. Uh, but with certain patients, uh, typically elderly or, or seniors, you know, they still demand that that physician print off a copy of that of e prescription and hand it to them because they want to leave with the prescription. And you know, that's kind of we we have to be mindful that consumers want healthcare how they want it, and you know, the, the healthcare system needs to help them uh, feel comfortable. Um, but no, I mean, sky's the limit with with data. So, so I'll disagree and say yes, <laughs> I think there really are limits to health uh, IT or technology generally. And I think that we have to think about um, improving the healthcare system in low tech and high tech ways. So some of the affordable accountable care organizations um, and the representatives that I talked to talked about the fact that they have very limited data sharing right now and although they're working on it. But in the interim, they're really working on things like picking up the phone, having providers data share by talking on the phone, technologies that are already available, or um, you know, printing paper records and sending those on and trying to develop low-tech systems to provide that. Um, another example I'll give is um, some of the community health clinics in Washington, D.C. were having um, issues with patients and not feeling like they had accessibility to the clinic. And, and they had processes where you had to queue, you waited all day mm -hmm. until a provider could see you. And they did that because they had a large share of no-shows. And then they implemented a low-tech solution, at least some of the clinics, where they did these automated patient reminders the night before that decreased the no-show rate, that allowed them to change the way in which they scheduled appointments. Mm -hmm. And instead of having just a first come, first serve and wait in line, they actually were able to schedule set times. And so I think that these low-tech kinds of um, solutions are important to be mindful of, that uh, technology is wonderful, but it, it's not necessarily um, the magic bullet. And I think there are limits to technology when we think about the physician-patient relationship, which is so important to consumer engagement. That's a low-tech thing. How are we educating physicians to make sure that um, they're talking to patients in a new way or in the way in which patients desire? Uh, so, so I would offer those ideas. <laughs> Thank you. I, lo I love disagreement. Um, I'm now opening the floor to questions. Anyone? We have a microphone. 
I'm Jeff Newman from uh, Sutter Health, and my question is to you, Sean. In view of the uh, increasing demand for primary care and the limited supply of physicians, where are your folks at with uh, advanced practice nurses and community health workers, the team approach? Sure. Um, I didn't think I would get out of here without that question, so um, it's good to get it out of the way. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the academy itself, uh, dating back to the early 2000s, uh, published a paper called The Future of Family Medicine, which basically brought to the forefront this concept of, of team-based uh, primary care. Um, I want to make one prefacing remark. I, I, don't, I don't lose any sleep over the workforce projections because I think the workforce projections are applicable to a healthcare delivery system of old, not a healthcare delivery system uh, that's new and innovative. So I think those numbers are going to fluctuate as, as we begin to move towards integrated team-based models. Uh, the academy itself, um, our, we have promoted it, and um, it's not always popular, but we, we think it's the right way, is, is a, a, a team of healthcare professionals um, under the leadership of a physician providing, providing care. And each of those healthcare professionals practicing uh, to the full extent of their education and licensure in whatever state that may be. And uh, we published a paper called uh, Primary Care in the 21st Century, and it, um, you know, I, I will be honest and say it got mixed reviews, um, mainly because both both sides, you know, our, the physician side and the, the nurse practitioner PA side, uh, both read it, in my opinion, for what they wanted it to say, not what the document did say. Um, 13 times in that document we talk about uh, the need for nurse practitioners to provide not only more services but uh, uh, to be more uh, integral in the you know management of, of patients on a day-to-day -day basis and we just think that needs to be under the leadership of, of a primary care physician and, and um, there's a little bit of people talking past each other right now and that's natural especially in Washington as, as you heard this morning I'm, I you know I always use the phrase you know the bacon you ate this morning for breakfast is somebody else's dead pig, um, and you know that's kind of that's kind of how a lot of these um, you know conversations work. But we are committed to a team-based model. Uh, we continue to promote a team-based model. Uh, we just think that team uh, has to be under the leadership of a physician. Next question. If you could just sure. wait for the microphone. Sure. Annette Gardner, UCSF. Um, perhaps speak to more of uh, what you're doing in terms of continuity of care. Sure. And, that, and structuring that relationship, because um, it's obviously not enough just to have a one-time deal with the patient yeah, and the provider. Um, that's a very fair point. And, and the, you know, the, the comprehensiveness and continuous of uh, primary care looks different everywhere. Um, uh, but the you know the the medical home concept is built around seven basic principles. But you know what what we see is um, not only nurse practitioners and physicians, but as needed uh, physical therapy dietitians. Uh, we're we're exploring um, you know the role of dentist in this healthcare team. There's a lot of of new data related to oral health and um, particularly cardiovascular disease and other things. And you know, should, should dentists be a part of this? Uh, we're getting ready to take on a major project looking at behavioral and mental health um, as part of, of this primary care healthcare team. I, I think uh, we will continue to learn. I think you know, primary care, like the rest of the healthcare system, has been so fragmented for so long that as you begin to pull people together, there's uh, you know, I mean, you have to pull in the pharmacist. Uh, you have to pull in the podiatrist. I mean, there's just so many things. Now, I don't think all of these people exist under one roof. I don't think that's, you know, what we mean by, you know, coordination. I think it's the availability of services with, you know, this primary care team really facilitating care across the full spectrum of healthcare services. Um, I, th I think, you know, the greatest thing that happened to the medical home movement, if you will, was, was managed care. Um, you know, many people, you know, chuckle when I say that, but managed care kind of taught a lot of lessons. And one of them was is that the, you know, the primary care physicians uh, or nurse practitioners or, or that point of entry into the healthcare system had to be facilitators of care. They couldn't be viewed as gatekeepers. There was, you know, patients don't like the concept of a gatekeeper. Uh, they do like the concept of a facilitator. And, and that's kind of where we are now.
but WellPoint, I mean, WellPoint to their to their credit, uh, you know, all really of the major insurers have kind of embraced this core, we'll call it redesign of the primary care system as kind of the foundation of healthcare. And they're all learning different things. Um, there's geographic uh, variations on what works and what doesn't. Um, different things work in the pediatric model than in the adult model. And so, but, you know, it, it, uh, healthcare has never been static in this country. So it, I think you'll see the, the definitions of what it means change for, for years to come. Question. Question. Hi, Lori Hack from Object Health. Um, for either Sean or, or you, Carol, have you seen uh, some efforts to really utilize both the low tech solutions of training staff for like team huddles and that sort of thing to create the care group, uh, but marrying that with some of the technology, um, you know, iPads and so forth? So I'll start. So I was at this um, conference where a lot of the executives of different accountable care organizations were brought together, some of them in the, the Brookings Dartmouth, Dartmouth Learning Clinic. And you know they, they really were incredibly diverse in their approaches, but there were very few of them were had a full interoperable health IT system going. And so we did see, I did hear a lot about these other sort of low-tech solutions where there was, you know, for example, a, a nurse care manager who was at a facility and doing calls. And in other cases, the ACOs had implemented that nurse care manager in particular physicians' offices. So not high-tech solutions, but really sort of lower-tech um, ways to try to improve care coordination. But certainly, you know, even if they didn't have the health IT interoperability to do the sharing, they were very concerned with having claims data in order to be able to understand, you know, how to target those efforts, which patients they needed to really focus in on. And like I said, some of them were choosing sort of the end of life patients or the, the ones that had multiple chronic conditions and then really focusing those low tech efforts on those subpopulations. Yeah, I, I would I would echo that. There's a lot of um, you know the American Board of Internal Medicine is funding a number of projects around kind of what works in office redesign and and the thing that's fascinating about it is it all works, um, which just kind of tells you how you know disruptive process change is. But from scribes to huddles to uh, morning conference calls to telemedicine, you know all of these interventions and process seem to be having. Um, a positive impact, but ironically, I, I'm the Pollyannish one about IT. Um, but you know, the thing that you know we continue to hear that has the most impact is when the patient leaves the office. If you just hand them a piece of paper that says these are the drugs you should be taking, this is when you should be taking them, this is the next. You know, you need, you need to go get your lab. But just, I mean, it's not any more low tech than a piece of paper, and that seems to have a very positive impact. I apologize, I'm going to have to cut the uh, questions here um, because we're running a little over. But the good news is these two authors are going to be in the last panel, so hold your question. They will actually be back for more questions. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break here, then we're going to go back, um, come back, uh, and then we'll go into our second panel, which is Innovation and in Action, which are the uh, wonderful examples of what's happening here in San Francisco. And we're really excited to have them on our panel. And so I want to uh, please join me in, in thanking our authors. Thank you.